appreciate you joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus, and I'm back with my co-host, back with uh, Daniel Sanders. Daniel has recently moved to Batesville, Arkansas. Daniel, how you doing? Doing all right. I guess you can say the the song "Back in the Saddle Again." <laughs> back in the saddle again. This is not your first stint in Arkansas. <laughs> no, this is my third stint. Yeah. Well, how are how are you doing down there? Are you living out of boxes or? Still living out some stuff, but uh, for the most part, got everything uh, taken care of. Kids went back to school this week, and uh, you know, last week I, I called and talked to you. You were talking about snow, and I was talking about 80 degrees at the same time. Yeah, I remember what I told you, too. <laughs> there was some sort of curse the ground you're on right now. <laughs> uh, it was a little uh, less fancy than that, but that's the general gist. Uh, but it's it's good to good to be back with you and um, sort of recorded a few uh, few episodes on my own and we were wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount and then last week we we started looking in Revelation I think it was your idea to talk about the seven churches from Asia by the way I thought it'd be a good good uh, switch over from talking about the Sermon on the Mount kind of seeing some of those principles and lack of principles being followed out by the churches. So we're going from like the beginning of the Lord's ministry decades later to the end. Uh, no, but I know what you mean. Uh, we'll, we'll see some of the things that we spoke about, like you said, being applied or not applied as it is. And so one of the things we looked at uh, last week, and let's see if I can get it up on the screen. We're going to be looking at the, like I said, the church in Ephesus today. But to, to look at that, let's see, last week we considered in Revelation chapter 1. And I was just, I was making the point that, you know, Revelation is so full of, of different signs, you know, the things that, you know, the Lord signified these things. And, you know, there in Revelation 1, well, what verse is it? I think it's, what is it, the first verse? Yeah things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his servant John. And that word signified there, it's like literally the word just signified. It's like it's going to be signs, it's going to be figures. And people always want to talk about Revelation. It's like all the figures, all the mm -hmm. signs. But when we talk about the, the churches in Asia, and I don't know about you, but it's like there's not many signs. You know, there in chapter 2 and chapter 3, that it is very straightforward for the most part. There may be a few signs here and there. There may be, there may be a little figurative language. But in Revelation 2 and 3, it's a lot of straightforward, hey, this is the problem. This yeah, is either the absolutely. problem, this is how I'm pleased with them, and this is what they need to do. Absolutely. We see some of these things taking place. And, uh, I mean, it is pretty straightforward. It is... Here's, you know, it, it, we see some, uh, the language that Jesus uses is also similar to what Paul also spoke about. Uh, point out some good things. If there were right. good things, point out some things that were needing to change. And uh, here's how you can change it. And here's going to be the results if you change or if you don't change. Right. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward with everything. Of You're either, you got five of those churches that are, that are living that were not living up to the expectations of what Christ had said, and he rebuked them for it. Right. And uh, the, the other two, they were told to remain faithful and to fight the good fight with the church in Smyrna and church in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's get into it. Let's read a little bit. Um, Daniel, you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? I'll I'll give you a break since you've been taking the, taking the stronghold for the past few weeks. All right, go for it. All right. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 down to verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. 
Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so here, I mean, kind of joking during the introduction, you know, talked about the beginning of the Lord's ministry to the end. But I will say, just there with that last verse, we're connecting, we're going all the way back to Genesis now. Yeah. And the, um, yeah. The tree of life, you know, in that language. Okay, so you have seven churches to Asia. Each each one of these is seven verses, right? Yeah, I believe Uh, so. Not all of them. Yep. Mine is not. Yep, I think so. No, I guess you're right. I thought they were all seven verses. Nope, I was wrong. Never mind, ignore me. Ignore me. I've, for some reason, I thought they were all seven verses. So, okay. So, we have we have the obvious problem, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's the loveless church. So, some of the points I thought we might make, you know, when it begins, there, there's a verse in the Old Testament where it talks about the Lord. The Lord walks in the camp, and um, point being. It's sort of like, once again, Genesis, the Lord walking in the garden. And here it's he who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Like the Lord knows what's going on in the churches. Yeah. And it's like he's, he's in their midst. He knows, he knows what's happening, both, frankly, both good and bad. So what sort of good things had the church in Ephesus? Because they had done, and the Lord recognized that they had done good things. So what... What sort of things had they done that were that were good? Well, they'd been faithful uh, to a certain extent for for a period of time. Um, you know, you look at, you know, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil, as we read there in verse two, and have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Um, you know, you look at the what the what the Ephesian church had done. We do have. Out of out of all these different churches, I would say that we have the most written about the right. church in Ephesus, uh, most recorded. Not only do we have the letter to to the Ephesians there in, in one of Paul's uh, yeah. uh, letters that he wrote, but also we have the uh, time that he spent there. It really, I know we could look at Acts chapter twenty, uh, talking about some of the different things and. This is also his last encounter uh, with the Ephesian elders there from verse 17 on to the end of the chapter. And it says there he spent three years with them and he was giving them some encouragement of to take hold of the flock, to shepherd the church of God right. uh, because there were going to be ravenous wolves that were going to come in. So there was this testing of the ravenous wolves that were happening right. and they had continued to uh, not allow that false teaching or that false doctrine to be able to infiltrate and overtake the church. So Jesus was commending them for such efforts here on that part was that they were remaining faithful to God and not giving in to the, uh, the false teaching at least. Yeah. Well, what are, okay. So we have, you know, Paul coming there in acts, right. And that's yep. where there were, how many were there? There was like, was it eight? Uh, oh, let's, let me look back and I can find things a little bit easier. There in, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 19, it says there 12. 12. There are 12 men, in, 12 men in all that were converted there. Wrong again. <laughs> so he comes there, Acts chapter 19. Yes. Then we have Acts 20, the elders are called. And then we have, of course, let's see what's next, the letter to the Ephesians, obviously. 
And then we have Timothy is in Ephesus. Right, so he's in Ephesus, so we can we can look at those to see more what's going on. And then we have this letter being sent to the church, to the angel of the church here in Revelation. So I think you're right. It's like we know a lot about Ephesus. Well, there's a progression there's a progression of everything that we see with the church in Ephesus and, and a full progression of here it was they were faithful, they were obedient. They were encouraged to remain faithful and obedient. They were, you know, Paul was kind of giving the, the the charge to this, and then we see, however long it was down the road, that they were falling. They they started they start struggling some. Yeah, and I I'm not sure. Let let me ask you the question: Do you think they realized they were struggling? I I would say no, probably. I, I yeah, I, I I would agree with you that I would say that's not. That they, they didn't realize it. They, 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 you know, we we spent time with Paul. We've given the charge. We're doing these things. I would think there were there was a little bit of obliviousness to that. And let me let me put it this way: I I think they had struggled, like you said, against the false doctrine. We'll talk more about. So so in that sense, they realized they had struggled, but I don't. I'm not sure they realized they themselves needed to repent. Yeah. And so I'd say um, that's a safe, safe conclusion on that. Yeah. And so, like I said, you know, the Lord, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. And, um, like, these are, these are good things. And that business about they had tested those who claimed to be apostles and found them to be liars. And actually, let's, let's, look, in, let's look in the book of Acts. Because I think that's where we see when Paul calls the Ephesian elders... Let's see, this is going to be Acts 20. When he calls for them, and we won't read the whole thing, but he warns them what's coming. Mm -hmm. And let's see. That's Acts 20, verses 28, down through verse 30, roughly. I I include verse 31 with it. Yeah, that he had warned them. And he yeah. says, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves, to all the flock. Um, again, he's just talking to the elders. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So that's coming from outside. Verse 30, Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so when we get up to Revelation and when we have, you know, this idea they had tested those who said they were apostles, found them to be liars, I think we, we're seeing that. Daniel, you've changed rooms. I have changed rooms. All right. We we lost our feed for a second. Um trying to get trying to get internet issues worked out, stuff like that. Um but anyway, we'll see if this is so hopefully, hopefully this is better. So what we were talking about was they had tested those who claimed to be apostles and yes. found them to be liars. And that there in Acts, when Paul, Paul's the Ephesian elders, he says, there's trouble coming. It's going to come from outside. It's going to come from inside. Also, I believe isn't it's Timothy who Paul says elders who are sinning needed to be rebuked in the presence of all. And, yeah. and so there were some issues in, in the leadership, frankly, in Ephesus. And it looks like the church had dealt with those, that, that the elders, the, the sound of the faithful elders there had probably dealt with these things. Timothy had dealt with these things. And the Lord is commending them there in verse 2. says, you've tested them. They claim to be apostles. They're not. You found them to be liars. We we might we might ask the question: How would they have tested them? Well, uh, I can say would... I I can say one thing. It's like there was something only the apostles could do that nobody else could, and that's imparting the gifts to somebody else. Yeah, and they these guys they may have been able to do the gifts. But, but the question is whether or not they could pass them on. 
Right. That so, would be a good, that'd be a good way of being able to test everything. If, if yeah, and there may have been other tests. You know, if they weren't witnesses to the resurrection. Um, yeah. You know things like that. So anyway. But but this is what they had done, and it it was good, and they were to be commended for that. And I would I would encourage people to recognize verse three. They were they had been laboring for the Lord's name's sake. And um they had not become weary. It's not that they were uh, at whatever point it, it it had not they had been struggling, but it had not worn them down. I think that's interesting in and of itself. Because they had not become weary, but then we get to the problem. We get to the lack. They had left their first love. So, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this in my notes. I was thinking about the rich young ruler. And that, you know, he had done a lot of things. And Jesus says, one thing you lack. And I think a lot of folks would be content with that. When, when Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, this is what you got to do. If you want yeah. to be complete, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. I think a lot of folks would have said, ah, he, he for, you know, for the most part, he's okay. Yeah. Well, it goes, you, you, not just stopping there, but, you know, you go further back into uh, what we were just talking about with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, verse 22. Now that one okay. says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does will my Father in heaven. Verse 22 says, For many in that day will say to me, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Right. There's a lot of good things that people were could have been claiming that they were doing, but still lacking in some. What did Jesus right. say in verse 23? I never knew you. So, I mean, there was that word of warning that Jesus was offering and was offering here to the church here. You're doing a lot of good things. But you're lacking in yeah. this, and they they had left their first love. And at, at some point, you know, we're we're into the territory territory of the royal law. You know, loving the Lord and loving your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, and yeah, forget, forgetting about you know forsaking forsaking part of it is unfortunately you know look at it it's forsaking all uh, when we when we neglect in doing. Part of God's will. Uh, yeah, right. Like the royal law, when Jesus says, "On this hangs the law and the prophets," He's saying, "Like everything hinges on this. Everything yeah. hinges on the love of the Lord." Absolutely. And, and they had left their they had left their first love, and, and it was they were in a they were in a perilous situation, and they needed to they needed to repent, and they needed to rekindle. The love they had for the Lord, you know. I we were talking before we started recording. I, I've heard people question whether or not love is an emotion, and, and I've heard people make the point before that that love is, and it it is. I do think it's interesting in this passage that love itself is called a work. There in verse five, you know, repent and do the first works. And I think it's called a work because it's simply something that we do. It, it originates with us. Yeah. And that, I, I guess in the sense, we love the Lord because he loved us first. So in a sense, it originates with him. But it's it's something, the Lord does not do it for us. That we have to love. And, and in my notes, I, I mentioned, faith is also called a work. Um, I think it's... So let me look at my notes real quick. I think it's in the Gospel of John that talks about that. I know I wrote it down somewhere, except I can't find it. Oh, where is it? Daniel? What are we looking for? What exactly are you looking for? Now, well, let's see. I can... It's in... Um... Let's see. It is. Oh, John 6, of verse 29. Where Jesus answers and says to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And that belief 
just because believing is something that we do. And therefore, it's considered a work if you will. Love is something that we do. That it's, it is, some, it, I think it is an emotion. I think we can show it's an emotion pretty easily. It, it's, a, it's, the, it's the emotion that motivates us to do yeah. other things. But in yeah, first Corinthians, which I think, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, which goes into uh, your, if I mentioned first, actually, I, uh, do, you, do, do your part first, because I'll add to it. Okay, First Corinthians 13, just, you know, when Paul lays out, it's like, these three things I could do, but if I don't have love, it doesn't profit anything. You know, the tongue of men of angels, the gift of prophecy, bestow all my goods to feed the poor. What he's saying is, I could, I could work, I could serve, I could do all these things, but if I'm not doing it out of love, it's nothing. It is possible to to feed the poor and not love the poor. It is possible to to serve. It is it is possible to worship on, in a certain sense even without love. And that if you don't have love, it's nothing. So that shows that love and works are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. It's possible to work and not love. And our, our verse in Revelation shows that because the church in Ephesus, uh, they were doing a lot of works, but they didn't love the Lord anymore. They had left their first love. Go ahead now. Yeah, I was going, uh, so adding to that, and that's where I think Colossians 3.14 really fits, fits in with what, with what we're talking about here. It says, but above all the, these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You start talking about all the different things that we have of uh, being able to put on verse 12, talking about uh, being holy, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Even if anyone has complained against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do above all those put on love. And that's where we see, again, we can do all the different things, but if we put on love with it, that, that, that completes it. That's what, that's what there's that motivation. There's what enhances all the different things and complements properly all the different things with love. You let know, let me Jesus, ask you, when, you. You know, when Jesus spoke about, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. You know, that passage. Yes. Sometimes folks will make the they, they try to make the point, and I think it's it's the wrong point. That loving others is the same as loving the Lord. I, and I, that's not true either. <laughs> just, just based on the royal law. What's the first yeah. commandment? The first commandment is to love God with everything. And the second, right. like it, right. is this, that you love your neighbor. So there, there are similarities with it. It's there, that, that, that love that you give right. to God, you know, there needs to be a similitude of love. But... God's still first right. with everything. And, and so I, I just want to make that point with, with Revelation 2. It, it is possible, we know, for example, from 1 John, whoever says he loves God and hates his brother, it's like you, it's not guaranteed that you do both. Right. And that if it, it's possible to, not, um, it's sinful, um, but here's my point. It's possible to love others, but not love the Lord. And I think it'll it breaks down and it's sinful, but to the to what the the to what the Ephesians were doing, they had left their first love. They yeah. had done a lot, but they had left their their first love. Yeah, and they yeah, were because you, you're giving you know going back to the royal law, you give God everything, right? You have to give God everything. If you're not giving God everything, then we're not fulfilling his commandment. And thus, you know, that, that love, yes, we can still love people, but if we don't have that love for God, we're still missing the mark, like what you're talking about. And, and I, I will is, say, like I said, I, I think everything breaks down. For example, what I mean by that, if you don't love the Lord, they, they had been doing a lot of things, a lot of good things. But if you, you know, your Colossians, how did your Colossians passage phrase it? Did it say rooted? Uh, no, no. It just says above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It holds everything together. Okay. We have that proper type of love. 
let me pull up a passage quick so folks can see it. The, the verse I was just thinking of where it talks about being rooted in love is Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, notice, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. And I just wanted to make the point that the Ephesians had been doing a lot of good things, but they'd yes. left their first love. I'm not sure they would have kept doing, at some point, even those good things they were doing starts falling away. Yeah. That if you don't love the Lord anymore, at some point you're not going to love others as well. And everything starts falling apart. Right. And that you have to, it begins with the love of the Lord. And so if the roots aren't, if the roots, if the roots are struggling, and that's the church in Ephesus, if the roots are struggling, the rest of the plant will soon follow suit. So anyway, the, the qu one of the questions I want to deal with, so, and I think we've already touched on it some, why, I think the question should be asked, why is, why has their love grown cold? What, how would you answer that? What do you, what do you think are some possibilities? Well, you, you think about, uh, we can, I'm going to start off by eliminating one at this, at this present time is they hadn't given in to false teaching. Okay. And, we're, and I know we're going to talk about that more here in just a few minutes, but Jesus pointed out there in verse two that, you know, why they left their first love. It wasn't that they were giving into false doctrine at that present time. Right. Looking at that, looking at verse six, well, we're going to look at that here in just a few moments, but I would, I, let's eliminate that one. Um, but I think then kind of, I think, I think it's a natural thing to say, well, sin, the, given into temptation, they've left God. Well, they've filled that with something else. What would that be? Well, It'd be the, the things of this world, things that have separated themselves from God, whether it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, some, something in that classification, uh, I think is very strong possibility. Yeah, and, and you could, let, let's put it this way. They had, they had tested those, you know, concerning false doctrine. Well, false doctrine comes in in different flavors. Yes. And so... They tested those who claimed to be apostles, rejected that, and they rejected the Nicolaitans. And we'll probably talk at some point, there, there's some question about what the Nicolaitans' doctrine was, what their deeds were. Uh, I think very simply, it's worldliness. Yeah. Um, yeah. On some level, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in future. Is it the, actually, is it the next church where it talks? No, Smyrna's next. Okay, I'm... I know, I know you're, um, oh, it's the compromising church verses 12 yeah. down through verse 17. Yeah, the church, yeah, the third, the third yeah. church in this series. So we may talk more about it at that point, but like I said, there, there's just, there's different false doctrine. Yes. And what, whatever's going on here, and we're, we're not sure. All, all we know based on, based on what we see in, in Acts, the letter to the Ephesians, Timothy, and here. I mean, you, you see, for, for one thing, and they, they had been fighting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they had, and not in a bad way. They had been fighting in a good way. Um, they had been, you know, again, it's Timothy who's told, fight the good fight of faith. And um, he's in Ephesus when he has to do that. And the Ephesians, I would suggest, had been fighting the good fight of faith. And man, when you're dealing with false doctrine, I mean, Daniel, you've been places before where you're you're dealing with false doctrine. It while the Lord says they had not become weary, something had changed. Yeah. And and I was in my notes. I I made a note to oh let's see it's oh Matthew twenty four. Let me pull this verse up. And I was just thinking about this idea. Matthew 24, at verse 12, this is in the midst of um, just what would be happening around the destruction of Jerusalem, things like that. But you have this, this simple idea. 
and because lawlessness will abound, the love of the love of many will grow cold. And just lawlessness and and the church in Ephesus, they had been dealing with a lot of lawlessness. I mean, they they'd been dealing with false teachers. And they had been dealing with with elders that had to be rebuked. Yeah. And that can take its toll. It can. And while they had not become weary, they they weren't they weren't they were not giving up the fight, but they They weren't giving up the fight, but they became vulnerable in different in other ways. Exactly. Exactly. They became vulnerable in a different way. And I think that's one thing about being a soldier for for the Lord. It's one thing to be courageous and to fight. It's another thing to be loving. Yeah. And um they had become vulnerable in another way and and the yeah. dev the devil had found the um the opening that he needed. Right. I I, I would compare that uh that, that thought, you know, whenever we have our we have our five senses, our you know for physical senses, and it's always been said that if you lose one of those senses, like if you lose your sight, other right. types of other types of uh, your other senses become more enhanced. I think it's the same exact thing where you're sitting there, you're fighting, you're 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 protecting, you're you're on this forefront of protecting yourself in so many ways. We've got a stronghold on something, but because you've used your energy. And to be able to, all of your energy to be able to put on that, like I said, you become vulnerable and, and become weaker at a different spot. And as you said, Satan's looking for that weak opening yep. to try to just creep in the door or to, to, to put their foot right there to stop it from being able to, uh, uh, or to be able to penetrate and to be able to gain access. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, we, we know for sure that's what was going on. Yeah. And, I mean, the Lord, he commends them, but like they 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 were they had come through the trenches and they may not have been out of it yet. Yeah. Um, in dealing with with these same issues, and obviously the love is is another issue. Uh, another thing in my notes, I I put they had been doing a lot of things right outwardly, and I mean it, it's it's like the Pharisees, and I'm not saying that they were. I'm not saying they were being Pharisaical. But it almost amounted to the same thing. Yeah, they were neglecting the weightier issues, namely love. And you know, like, like I said, you know, in in the beginning, we started this with: Do you really think they? Do you think they realized how much they were struggling? And I don't think they did. And I don't think we sometimes we don't realize how much we're struggling because it's like. Oh well, you know we're going to church and we're taking the Lord's supper and we're we're praying and we're giving. You know the Ephesians could have said, "Listen, the Ephesians probably read verses one down through verse three and said, "Yep, we're good." <laughs> and then they got to verse four and it's like, "Oh no, yeah." And um, it, it just would have been easy to to look at things outwardly and think, "Oh, that's good." Like, no. That's Phariseeism. That it amounts to the same thing, at least. That everything may look good outwardly, but inwardly, uh, -uh things aren't good. You're dying. That's how the Lord condemns the Pharisees. Um, full of dead men's bones, I believe. So, something yeah. else I I wanted to add as well. It's um, let's look back. Where's the Ephesian elder account, Daniel? Uh, that's. Uh, where Paul's with him in Acts 20, verse 7, beginning verse 7. All right, let's actually back up. So it's chapter 19 where he comes there. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, he's there, and then they have the riot as well. Let's see. And Paul comes there. You know, he, they had been baptized with John's baptism when they heard about the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, Right. Verse 7, the men were about 12 in all. I wanted to, to think about what had happened. He goes in the synagogue, spoke for three months. Verse 10 especially. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. 
both Jews and Greeks. Some of the commentators, they make the point that why, why does Ephesus come first in Revelation? For one thing, you know, John's on the island of Patmos. That's right off the coast of Ephesus. And so Ephesus was the closest church. Yeah. But it, it was from Ephesus. Ephesus had influenced the, the church in, in, in Ephesus had influenced the entire region. And um, it, it would have been... They're at the forefront of everything there in that yeah, region. They, they could have been proud of that. And it's like, yeah. you know, from humble beginnings, from just 12 men in all, verse 7, all of Asia heard because, because of what was going on in Ephesus. It would have been easy to be proud, I guess is the point I wanted to make. And um, they had done a lot of good work. They had done a lot of good work. But now all of a sudden they're, they're dying and they don't realize it. I don't know. Any, anything else you can think of as for why, why their love would have waned? Well, I, I, was, I was going to also include uh, there, I'm going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Uh, it says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Just adding yeah. to that idea of pride, you know, could it have been the fact that they were on the forefront? Could it have been the fact that they were, you know, the ones that were going, they were, they were the, the beacon for all of Asia Minor. Right. Uh, being able to reach out to the churches in Philadelphia, Pergamos, Patmos, or not Patmos, but uh, Smyrna. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you start listing off Sardis, all the different churches that are listed here. Uh, well, we're the ones that kind of let it all out. And now, we, you know, again, easy to be able to overlook. Well, we, we, we were able to help with all this. Think about it. We, you know, we too could fall. You know, these right. other churches are falling, and now we're also in the same boat as this. Even though, even if we were the church that was, you know, there on the coastline and kind of the the hot the hot spot of everything at yep. the time. Yep. So very much so. They um, it it was happening. That's a good good point. So back to our passage again in Revelation. Um, some of the other we we already touched on, you know, you've left your first love. I, I've heard people say before, and I think it's how do you how do you teach someone how to love? I think it's possible. Other passages show that about the older women teaching the younger women how to love their husbands. But they're gonna have to find this within themselves. Yeah. Is what they're gonna have to do, and it's that's gonna be hard. Um and the Lord knows it's going to be hard, but they're going to have to repent and do the first works. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Yeah, he's speaking um, about those those that have fallen. I mean, you know, you just look at that. I mean, it's pretty plain, Jane. Those that have fallen, you need to you need to remember from where you have fallen. Daniel, uh, we won't talk about it today because I don't want to spring this on you because it's somewhat of a, a meaty question. But I want to, at some point in our studies. I want to deal with the question, how do you know, you know, because the Lord, the Lord says repeatedly, even, even here he says, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. We're going to talk about what that means and how, how would you know that it happened? Namely, what, what I'm going to is, I think sometimes people will look at a church, for example, like, like um, is it Sardis that's the dead church? Yeah. But yet, even in Sardis, there were those who had not defiled their garments. And what the, the question I want to address is, how do, you know when a, how do you know when a local church has stopped being the Lord's church? That, that question. Okay. Because I think sometimes folks, you know, when the Lord says, I will come and remove your lampstand, I'd like at some point to talk about what that means, what the significance of that is, and and the, 
the consequences, if you will. Okay. I'm just because writing it down even here, that way I remember. Do what? I said I'm just writing it. That's okay. why I'm looking down. I'm I'm writing it down that way in my book. My, my I mean, you you, you kind of know where I'm going with that, as far as yeah, yeah. You, when when does it come to a point when when a church becomes unfaithful? Uh, you know, there was some obvious things that there were. There, there's evidences of that. Looking here at these seven churches. Uh, especially when you, you just mentioned Sardis being dead. Jesus said you're dead. Right. Uh, so there is, there is evidence and there's a, there is a, comes a point when you do know that a church is dead. And so that's, um, I think sometimes what happens is we, because judgment is individual. Yeah. That sometimes we give a congregation a pass and we say well you know even at a dead church there are those who are not defiled so that means i can go to this congregation over here this means i could go i could go to a denomination this means i could i could do that because i mean if there if there were good people at a dead church then that means i can go wherever i want and be just fine that's kind of the issue that I'm wanting to, at some point, I'd like to like to address. Um, and uh, frankly, I had not noticed, this is pretty strong language even here in Revelation 2 of verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Because I think ultimately the question is, for, for one thing, people would probably ask, fallen from what? How would you answer? Yeah. You know, had they fallen or not? The Lord says they'd fallen. Yeah, it says that you know they've fallen out of favor. I mean, that's why the very the, the very next thing is what repent and right. do the first works. And so, even here, uh, we see the seriousness of it because the question is, well, were they saved or not? And and I it, think it's it, sort it, of like. It's like Paul in Philippians. Um, all I know is if they didn't repent, the Lord was not going exactly. to be pleased with them. Exactly. And that's where we can look at, you know, if they were fine, if they were true, if we could say, if someone could conclude they were truly fine, then Jesus wouldn't have said repent. And he says it twice right, right there in that in that verse. Right. Repent, do the first works, or else I will, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from place unless you repent, which means that there was sin involved of some sort, that there was that need of repentance. And we know the wages required. of sin. Yes. So, I mean, anyway, I'd like to talk more about that as we as we go along. To the to the Ephesians credit, verse six, hey, they hated the right thing. <laughs> Yeah. And and in talking about love and hate, sometimes folks they'll say, Oh well, you know, now Brother Sanders, you know we're not supposed to hate. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things that comes to mind with this there in verse six, you want to pull up Romans chapter twelve, verse nine. Romans twelve nine. Yes, sir. Romans twelve nine, what does it say there? Let love be without what? Without hypocrisy. Abhor or hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Whatever the deeds, and I know you said we were going to talk about that more here in a couple, couple more yeah. weeks with uh, the compromising church. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. What does it say? Why are we doing that? Because we don't want our love to be hypocritical. Right. We have to love God and love Him properly and the way that He intended and the way that He desires. And so, Again, as you point, as we give credit to the Ephesians, they abhorred, they hated what was evil. They hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They hate, or I should say, the doctrine. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Going back to our text there in verse six. Yeah. Uh, so there was all this going on. They hated those things, and you know, that is commendable. Uh, there was still some need to repent, but you know, we don't want to, you know, as Jesus points out with with all these different churches. He wanted to point out some good. Instead of just rebuke, 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 there's a time to rebuke. 
right. also a time to encourage and exhort. And that's what he's in, he's exhorting where there was moments to exhort, to encourage, to uplift, but there was also needs to rebuke with some of these different churches. And that's what he was, you know, showing showing both emotions or showing both <laughs> ways of teaching in this way. Yep, very much so. Verse seven, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. It's not just for the Ephesians. In as much as the letter is being sent to them, to the angel of the church, it's not just for them. And that we have to learn the same same things. And um we have to overcome. And we can do that with the Lord. Yeah. And, um we better love the Lord. So you know, just because you read that verse in Romans about hypocrisy, hypocrisy comes in different flavors too. Yes. And the church in Ephesus, they were doing a lot of good, but they didn't love the Lord. Yeah. Which we could say there was hypocrisy involved there's, with that. There's, yeah. That, that was the point I wanted to make, that on some level that's hypocrisy. So we must we must overcome. Anything else you wanted to add, Daniel? Uh, no, I, well, I was going to, I know we were talking about it with some of the notes, you know, closing out there with Ephesians 6, 23 and 24. Uh, you know, there's, what there's work to be done. Ephesians chapter six, verse 23 and 24. I know you okay. had that. We we're talking about that earlier on using, uh, from your notes, you know, yeah. peace to the brethren, love with faith from God, the father, Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus in sincerity. Right. That, that that word, he closes out with sincerity. It needs to be genuine. Going along with what we were just talking about, let love be without hypocrisy. Let it be authentic. Let it be genuine. Let it be true. When we talk about something that we, we love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. I, I had not, before before this this podcast, I had not connected those last two vers- verses of Ephesians with revelation but it's interesting it is it's interesting how paul closes out that and then w- what the next record that we have of ephesus is they had left their first love yeah yep so and uh, it can happen yeah it, it can happen and and I'll, I'll also say this just because this has also been on our minds um it, it, it's easy to say, well, the grace of love is so wonderful that it will overlook our sins. Only if we repent. Only if we repent. And that grace and loving our Lord in sincerity go hand in hand. Yes. Just based on this verse. And that if we don't love the Lord in sincerity, then we're not taking advantage of the Lord's grace. Daniel, tell us where you're at. Here, I'll, I'll even put you up on the big screen there. All right. I am in Batesville, Arkansas, which is just on the south end of the Ozark Mountains. Uh, we just got our website up and going. Uh, QuailValleyChurchOfChrist.org is our website. Just got that started yesterday. Okay. Um, so, again, we're just on the north cent- – I'd almost consider it – Right there, north central part of Arkansas. Uh, we're about an hour and a half north of Jonesboro, or not Jonesboro, Little Rock, about an hour uh, west of Jonesboro, which is where Arkansas State is. Yeah. And then we're probably about an hour and a half to two hours away. If, if you could go straight to Fayetteville, which is up in the northwest corner. So, yeah. So, how far are you from the Missouri border? I would. I would say I, I would, guess, I would the, guess about it if I, if I could get there straight and not have to zigzag, um, I could probably be there in about an hour and twenty minutes. I, I was about to say I I would say as the crow flies, but I know there are no roads in that part of Arkansas <laughs> that are as straight There's as the one, crow flies. So the the straightest road they just they, I mean they've got it all done. It goes from Little Rock all the way up to Walnut Ridge, which is probably about. 30 minutes west of okay. or 30 minutes east of me. They've okay. got all that going. Like that's where that you used to live on, right off of going from BB. Yeah. They've got that four lane all the way uh up to uh Pocahontas. Really? Which is right there on the Missouri border. Yeah. 
Okay. So they're they're working on that to be the new I fifty seven actually. So nice. you can actually get the Lamberts real easy. Lamberts throw rolls. We'll throw nice. a, go and get hit in the head with a dinner roll. Here. Well, glad you're down there. Glad you're glad you're doing well, getting settled in and everything. Glad you're able to to be back on here with me. Thank you. Glad to be back on too. Yep. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Hope this study's been beneficial. And of course, next week, Lord willing, we will look at, let's see, the next one is the church in Smyrna. So we'll pick up there next week. Thank you very much for joining us as we all look to Jesus. Good evening. Hey, hey, hey.